Hello, this is a presentation by the Susquehanna Valley Church of Christ. It is important for Christians to gather around the Lord's table on the first day of the week in order to remember the death, the burial, the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We wanted to provide for you an aid to help you remember exactly what took place there and a way to help us to focus our hearts and our minds upon the Lord. Please turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning with verse 23. There we read, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which was broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup. When he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. Jesus stated that we were supposed to partake of the Lord's Supper in remembrance of him. We often pray for the Lord to help, fo help us to focus on the, his things by asking him to remove all the distractions that are before us. And especially at this time, there are a lot of distractions. We're worried about our health. We're worried about finances. We're worried about our family. We're worried about the state of our country. So many things that are going through our minds. But it's important for us to focus upon our Lord. Now, we can do this several ways, several things that can be done to help us to keep our minds on the Lord during the Lord's Supper. We might sing a song. We might read a scripture. We may have someone like myself speak a few words about what the Lord's Supper means. And these things are good and helpful. But the bottom line is that no one else can worship for us. We must use our own mind to remember Jesus during the Lord's Supper. And with that in mind, someone many years ago developed a very helpful mnemonic to aid us in remembering the Lord when we partake of the Lord's Supper. And it's real simple. If you can count to seven, you can always keep this in mind while partaking the Lord's Supper. Let's talk about that this morning. During the Lord's Supper, let us remember that there was one Lord. Jesus is Lord of all men, of the earth, of all the universe. 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 6 states, But to us there is but one God, the Father, whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. Paul told the church at Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 5, There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. But why did the Lord have to die on the cross? Because man is a sinner, and he merits, therefore, the penalty of death. Paul says in Romans chapter 6 and verse number 23 that the wages of sin is death. There is nothing that man can do to redeem himself from this situation. The psalmist states in Psalm 49 and verse number 1, None of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him. For man to be redeemed, God had to take upon himself the burden of redemption. He accomplished this through his only begotten Son, Jesus. Jesus must be Lord to redeem us, from our sins. His blood must be pure to satisfy the justice of God and to pay the penalty. In 2 Corinthians 5 and verse number 21, we read, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And so let us remember during the Lord's Supper that there was one Lord. But also let us remember that there were two thieves, Matthew 27 and verse number 38 says, Then there were two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and another on the left. Mark continues that thought in Mark 15, begins verse number 27. And with him they crucified two thieves, 
the one on his right hand, the other on his left. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, and he was numbered with the transgressors. It is not coincidental that this is mentioned in the narrative. Jesus died the death of a common criminal, and common criminals died alongside him. The two thieves further emphasize that Jesus paid the penalty for our sin. We should have died on the cross that day, just like those common criminals, because that's what man lost in sin is to God, a common criminal. The two thieves represent all of mankind. They represent me and they represent you. Both thieves initially, Matthew tells us in Matthew 27, verse number 30, 34, railed upon Jesus. He said the thieves also, which were crucified with him, cast the same in his teeth. But one thief repented, and Luke tells us about him in Luke chapter 23, beginning with verse number 39. He states there, And one of the malefactors, which were hanged, railed on him, saying, If thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. But the other, answering, rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. You see, one of these thieves was unrepentant. The other thief was repentant. And all of mankind fits into one of these two categories. Let us remember during the Lord's Supper that there were two thieves. But also keep in mind that there were three crosses. Again in Luke chapter 23, back up to verse number 33 this time, Luke records, And when they were come to the place which was called Calvary, There they crucified him. That's one cross. And the malefactors, one on the right hand, there's the second cross, and the other on the left, that's three crosses. The cross was Rome's solution to the problem of capital punishment, and it was nothing but an instrument of torture. It was a rather simple device composed of two wooden beams that crossed each other, The victim's hands were nailed on the horizontal beam and his feet nailed to the vertical one. Behind the victim's leg, there was a wooden block and that was put there in order to keep the victim from stretching and pushing himself up in order to catch his breath. Most victims who were nailed to the cross took days to die. These crosses were set up on the major roadways that came into a city and this is done with the purpose of showing what would happen if you were a criminal in this city? There were three crosses on that day. Let us remember that there should have been only two. Number four, there were four parts of the garment. We read in John nineteen twenty three and 24, Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts, to every soldier apart, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout, and they said among themselves, Let us not rend it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled which saith, They parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things therefore the soldiers did. Those individuals who were crucified were stripped of their last remaining dignity. Their last remaining possessions were taken from them and given as a payment to the soldiers whose dirty job it was to make sure that they died. Jesus' outer cloak was torn into four parts so that it could be evenly divided. The inner coat, however, was without seam. This was valuable. So instead of tearing it, they gambled for it. This incident reminds us that everything that was done was a fulfillment of the prophecy. Even the actions of Jesus' enemies fulfilled God's prophecies. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 22, now keep in mind, this is some thousand years before Jesus died. He said, for dogs have compassed me, 
The assembly of the wicked hath enclosed me. They pierce my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones. They look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. This incident reminds us that Jesus lived a life of poverty. All of his worldly possessions came down to two articles of clothing. Matthew chapter 8 records for us the words of Jesus when he said, The foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And Paul records for us in 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. During the Lord's Supper, let us remember that there were four parts of Jesus' garments. Also, let's remember his five wounds. Jesus was crucified with three nails, one in each hand and one in both feet, and that made four large wounds in his body. In John chapter 20 and verse number 25, Thomas knew that those wounds were there, and when they told him that Jesus had arisen, he had doubt. And he said, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand in his side, I will not believe. The nails were likely placed in the wrist between the two bones so that the hands would not tear away. I know it sounds gruesome, but that's the way they did it. The nails in his feet likely pierced between the metatarsals and the middle of the top of the foot. And Jesus' side was pierced with one spear. That's the fifth wound. In John chapter 19 and verse 34, John writes, But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. This reminds us that his flesh was broken, his body was torn, and his blood was drained out. Let us remember the five wounds that Jesus suffered. But also let's remember the six hours. You see, he hung there suspended on that cross between heaven and earth for six hours. Mark 13, or excuse me, Mark 15, verse 25, and we're going to have to do a little math here, says, and it was the third hour and they crucified him. And then Matthew records for us in Matthew 27, verse number 45. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over, all over all the land until the ninth hour. Well, from the third hour to the ninth hour is six hours. And it's during those six hours, every few moments, Jesus would try to push down his legs to lift himself up to catch a breath. He had to endure that crown of thorns that had been shoved down upon his head. And keep in mind, he was scourged just a little while before this. And that back was rubbing against that cross. And I can promise you that they didn't sand down that cross. Those who crucified him mocked him while he hung there. He didn't just hang there with his loved ones about him, praying for him. He hung there with people who were making fun of him. And Mark tells us in Mark 15, beginning verse 29, that they passed by and railed on him. During the Lord's Supper, let us remember that there were six hours that Jesus hung on that cross. And finally, let us remember the seven sayings that Jesus said on the cross. And we won't take a lot of time, but we will mention each of these. In Luke 23, beginning with verse 34, Jesus said, uh, then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. In John chapter 19, beginning with verse 26, when Jesus saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he said unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. And then he said to his disciple, Behold thy mother. In Luke chapter 23 and verse 43, Jesus said, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. In Mark chapter 15 and verse 34, we read, at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? 
In John chapter 19 and verse 28, after this, Jesus, knowing all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. A couple of verses later in verse 30 of John 19, when Jesus had therefore received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. And Luke gives us a little bit more uh, into that last moment of Jesus' life on this earth. In Luke 23 and verse 46, when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. When we gather around the Lord's table, it's important for us to put our memory to work. And it's important for us to remember, again, as easy as counting to seven, one Lord, two thieves, three crosses, four parts of the garment, five wounds, six hours, seven sayings. May God bless you this morning as you partake of the Lord's Supper. As you gather around his table, wherever you're at, help you to remember what occurred on that day. God bless.